Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture eight. So as you can see from the slide, uh, the theme for today will be arbitration, which, uh, as you know, a common problem that occurs not just in hardware design, but systems in general. And as of course, when you have multiple entities and need a resource, how do you decide uh, who gets it and when? And so in order to discuss this topic, we'll be covering a number of uh, hardware related themes, such as one hotter than encodings, priority encoders, et cetera. If you haven't seen those before, don't worry, we'll be covering those from scratch today. But also the purpose of today's lecture is a way to kind of integrate what we've covered the last few lectures. Remember uh, on Wednesday, we talked about how to decouple things using the ready valid signaling. And then last week we talked about how to encapsulate things and within functions, classes, and bundles, right? And we'll be using all those concepts today. We'll be uh, using uh, recursive functions to build up really sophisticated generators and how to kind of build up internal topologies. We'll be defining bundles to have a nice kind of compact uh, I.O. and passing those around. And we'll also be using decoupled interfaces. So today is also kind of a nice set of case studies showing all these things playing out. Okay, well, let's get to it. So uh, as I said, one hot encodings, priority encoders, arbiters. So really arbiters are kind of us building way up to that point. And we'll tie it together with yet another case study on a crossbar. It's actually a pretty nice example of how you can have a pretty sophisticated uh, set generation capabilities with chisel is actually not too many lines of code and the way we're doing today we aren't using any functional programming in about two weeks after we cover functional program we'll come back to it and you can see how we can make it even more compact code as well as even more robust in terms of flexibility and so that's exciting it's really kind of getting to the fun part of what we can do with this language uh okay let's go ahead and load in our notebook great and Let's talk about one hot encodings, right? So this is something that's a nice abstraction to have in hardware design where occasionally uh, you have an entity and you think it's easiest to do what's called a one hot encoding. And that is where you have a collection of wires or a bus. And the rule is that exactly one of these wires must be high, yeah, i.e. one, right? So uh, I have one, one, and then n minus one zeros, right? And all that changes is where that one is, but there's exactly one, right? And so what's nice about this is a lot of times we can make logic very simple where we can have a single input coming in and we can operate on it, right? The, uh, so you can kind of imagine how the hardware would look if you have, you know, some signal coming in, perhaps it's an encoded number in binary, right? You know, some n bit number, so it represents two then things. So of course, when you turn into one hot encodings, it now becomes two the n, uh, you know, bits coming out. So let's say I had only, you know, a four bit number coming in here. Well, then let's say 16 wires coming out over here. And each of these wires are going to be zero, except for one of them, which is going to be the wire that corresponds to the index. That's this number, right? That's what we're trying to build. And yeah, there'll be times we're having, you know, a bunch of zeros and exactly one one. It makes it easier to build other things later down the system. Uh, and some examples you might imagine, or for example, in like in a processor, right? Where you imagine your register file where you, you know, have your few two uh, registers and you have that instruction writing back data. And you're actually only going to change one of those three two registers, right? So what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna have 31 out of those 32 of those registers not change your value. And then you wanna have that write enable, that change signal on for exactly one of them, or potentially zero if there's not instructions not writing back, right? And so a one on coding is kind of a graceful way to do this. You can imagine the alternative to one on coding would be you pass around this encoded, you know, uh, dense index, and then every word it needs to act on it kind of has to have its own comparator saying, oh, is this two, is this three, is this four, is this five, right? And that, that's of course very inefficient. So we can use this encoder to kind of do that conversion for us and pass around these one-hot signals. And sometimes you'll have a design where you're able to naturally generate one-hot signals and then pass them along through multiple stages without having to actually deliberately, you know, encode or decode. So that's kind of nice. Um, cool, okay, questions on the functionality of a one-hot encoding. All right, well, so that's, that's the goal. Let's talk about how we might go about building one of these encoders uh, in Chisel, right? So remember, we're gonna take in um, a uh, n-bit signal, right? And we're gonna turn it into two to the n, you know, one-bit things, right? So, uh, you know, we have some in width, and then our out width is gonna be, you know, uh, two to the power of that, right? So we want to have that kind of expansion. Okay, and so we're going to require, we have to have, you know, a non-zero in width, sure. And so how are we going to put this together? Well, 
Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead, I think I might have skipped a slide. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, put these together, right? So we have a recursive function here that's going to go through. And uh, well, first, let's kind of just appreciate the uh, control structure, not worry about what it's actually doing. So from a control structure point of view, we're calling initially on zero. Uh, we see that as long as this index, that's the argument to this helper function, this recursive, is less than out with, which of course is some number over here, it's gonna keep recursing, right? It's gonna call helper again with index increased by one. And eventually, you know, index equals out with, and we're gonna get this base case and not recursively call anymore. So inspecting this, help, this recursive function, we can see this can be called, you know, out with times. Okay, well, what's it doing? It's simply concatenating uh, together things. In particular, it's concatenating uh, the result of these nested calls from recursion, right? So um, we're going to call helper to get, uh, you know, the next level. And whatever that returns, we're going to go ahead and concatenate that with a comparator, right? And so we see this comparator, of course, is saying, hey, is this input, you know, this densely encoded binary number equal to the index I'm supposed to be responsible for, right? So for example, you know, you can imagine when this function is actually called for zero, it's going to call for one, it's going to be called for two, because it keeps being called recursively. Okay, so you know, this variable is going to call for four. Well, okay, is, is it four? If it is four, this is going to be true. And because, you know, you see how this way to set up, each one of these uh, comparators is given a unique index, thus only one of them can be true at a time. Now, uh, you might say, well, what happens if, you know, the input to our whole thing is zero? Well, that means it's gonna equal zero, right? We initially call this on zero. Um, and so this is gonna recursively kind of build it up and we're building up one bit at a time. So, you know, we are, here's a bit I'm creating on this call and then I'm gonna, you know, append that to the result of the recursive call. And so we're using recursion here to kind of go through it. So even though it might seem inefficient to do recursion, it's fine, it's linear. And this recursion, of course, uh, is in the generator, but the actual hardware is gonna be uh, hopefully nice and clean, right? So if we keep it small, and let's just do a two-bit one. Uh, oops, let's see if I can get that scrolling ability. Well, let's make the text smaller. Um, you can see here, it does what we're kind of talking about, right? Where it goes ahead and does the comparisons, you know, is it three, is it two, is it one, is it zero? Um, and then um, it goes ahead and concatenates them all together, right? So yeah, um, there we have it. Uh, looks like we have a slight uh, issue where we have one more level than we might need. Uh, and so, yeah, I guess we could make the recursion a little more careful by doing a minus one in here, but um, Actually, I'll just do it right now uh, so that we don't forget. Uh, and yeah, there we go. Now we have the right thing. Three, two, one, zero. Small, small bug. So yeah, it's good to check your hardware. Sometimes looking at the Verilog is a way to see what it's doing. That might not be visible if you're looking at just simulation behavior. Uh, but cool. Okay. I'm going to pause for questions so far. I kind of tossed out a lot of stuff of recursion and such. Cool. Okay, so uh, we've built this function. We can see the hardware with the print Verilog. Um, what happens if you go try and test it? So this is kind of not really a test. It's more of just a demo of it operating. So what I'm going to do is uh, we're just going to, you know, uh, pass in some things. And oops, I have to uncomment my print line so we can see what it's doing. And we can see, for example, what the input is and what the one hot encoding is. And because of the way it prints binary numbers, it doesn't bother printing leading zeros, at least not with the specifier. But you can see, okay, if it's a zero, we get, you know, the zero bit. If it's a one coming in, we get the, only the one bit high. If it's a two, it's a two. So you can kind of see this behavior playing out. And, you know, here we went through the effort to make our own. This is a kind of a good example of how to use this recursive helper function to kind of build this stuff up. However, you can imagine 
uh, that this is a very common thing. And so, yeah, there is this in the standard library. And so as I usually recommend, if it's in the library, you should use it rather than writing your own. And yeah, and it has the exact same behavior. If you look at the Verilog, I think it's going to be a little tidier. I think it's going to just do a shift, remember, right? Uh, oops, get the print out of there. The print's always going to cause a lot of extra stuff in the Verilog. And yeah, you can see that the live revocation doesn't even bother using recursion. It just says, hey, you know, you have a number coming in. Let's just shift over that many times, right? So you can imagine if this is zero and this is, you know, this, at first you might say, oh, this is a lot simpler. Maybe not, depending on the hardware, right? Because, you know, shifters, this is a dynamic shifter. They aren't the cheapest in hardware. So perhaps our comparative solution when optimized could be comparable. I don't know. Uh, one of the things we got to run through tools and find out. Cool. Okay. Checking for questions. Is there a question? Let me check my audio, make sure I'm not missing it. Uh... I'm not hearing it if you're speaking. So let me double check what's going on with my uh, audio. I believe I have the right audio device selected and uh, volume. Okay, so chat is telling me that yes, the person is speaking, but no one else can hear them either. I will give them a second to debug. <laughs> uh, no problem. Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, that might be more apparent. We see future examples. Yeah. So the question is, uh, yeah. So the, the question to repeat for the recording was, you know, why we understand what we're building, but why, uh, yeah. One hot encoding so said the benefit would be more apparent later on speaking abstractly from the prior slide. Um, you know, uh, kind of, I was discussing that, you know, you often use these when you have some collection of things, you only want to like do something to one at a time. Uh, and this happens a lot of times in architecture when you know you have some number of entries or things you want to kind of have only one thing. Uh, but uh, I might ask you to re-ask that question at the end of today's lecture if the following content doesn't show examples of us using one hot. So we are going to use one hot in the following things. And so hopefully uh, that'll better motivate why we're building a one hot. Um, cool. Great. Uh, other questions? Cool. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we have this one hot encoding. What are we going to use it for? Um, well, let's go ahead and render the slide. Um, we can use it for a few things. And so another related thing we might use a lot in hardware is something called a priority encoder. And that is when you, um, have multiple things and you want to somehow, uh, tie break, right? So for example, uh, you might decide when you formalize this, say, Hey, if I have a collection of wires, I want to turn the index of the least significant bit that is high, given some sort of, you know, predefined precedence ordering, right? IE priority. Uh, and so you can imagine this is going to be an important ingredient for when we build arbiters, right? For arbiters, we need to have choosing between multiple simultaneous requests. Um, how do we choose that? Well, a key building block for that's going to be this priority encoder, right? Um, but even outside of arbiters, right? You kind of use a lot of times, right? You can imagine, let's say you're trying to fill in empty slots and registers, you have some sort of, you know, data store, uh, you want to use a priority encoder to find that first fit, right? So all those things that are empty are going to kind of be sending out a signal and you want to find the first one. And so Chisel provides these, right? There's a priority encoder that works on an index. If you want to work from a one hot input, which is also possible, there is a priority encoder one hot. Um, there's actually even one that includes a mux already. So sometimes it's very common to use a priority encoder to select things. And so they just kind of combine those two together for you. Um, and so you may ask, well, what happens with a priority encoder having no number coming in? I'm trying to figure out uh, which one wins. Um, well, if it's zero, does that mean nobody wins? Uh, well, technically you shouldn't have a zero, but if you did, uh, you know, depending on a priority encoder, you might see what you get. Uh, let me more clearly go ahead and talk about the structure internally, right? So let's say, for example, we want to have the lowest index win out. So if you imagine um, a, uh, you know, one hot number coming in, so we're using that concept right away. So you have, you know, let's say 32 bits, 
You know exactly one of them is one at a time. And um, you want to know, uh, you know, which one's the highest one is hot. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be one hot in that case. It's actually technically not going to be one hot. It's going to just be bitwise, I should say. Um, it's kind of two ways you could build it architecturally. Uh, one is you could simply just put together this big long chain of muxes and say, hey, uh, you know, um, you can see that because, you know, this last connection, right, you know, if this one happens to be true, it's going to be one, right? Um, because the one's the highest bit, right? But how, for example, if you know if this was a zero, you're going to pass through to all the prior ones. So you can see that, you know, depending on which bits are here, they may all be choosing things, but the one that's going to win is going to be the one that's with the lowest index. And so you can see we're here building up, you know, n muxes. That's one way of doing it. The other way is we could do it with gates, right? So actually not drawn because it would be too big, but these are actually AND gates, right? So this is a no gate, just a single wire, but this is, you know, two things added together. This is up to n minus one things added together. Uh, and you basically kind of see, okay, well, under what, this kind of, you know, brute force enumerating the conditions, right? Okay, well, if this lowest bit is high, that always wins, right? Then um, how about this next one? Well, if the lowest bit is zero and then the second lowest bit is one, okay, then that's going to win, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So maybe to repeat this one more time to clarify, the input could have any arbitrary pattern of ones and zeros, right? It's not one hot. I should perhaps maybe remind you that when it says one hot here, the, the output is one hot, right? So you can imagine it could be saying a number, oh yes, you know, uh, all of all these bits index 14 one, or in this case, it's actually just saying uh, via the um, one hot encoding, right? So uh, I've, you know, n bits coming in, n bits coming out, and it's just a question of finding the, the lowest bit that's one, right? So potentially coming in, I could have had multiple bits high, after going through a one hot priority encoder and have exactly one bit high. Okay, so given these two ways of doing it, we actually can go ahead and do this in chisel. So uh, both of those structures, you can kind of see these are good examples for us to kind of do these recursive uh, combinations of us kind of building things up. Okay, there's a question from chat. Uh, so the question is about trying to be clear about when I say lowest or MSB. Yeah, so uh, let's be extra clear about this. When I say lowest, we're talking zero, right? Uh, you know, the least significant bit. So it's the LSB. The MSB is over here, right? So yeah, the choice was made for this priority encoder that we're giving priority in terms of least significance, right? That's what we're prioritizing on. Uh, you can imagine you could do priority code in reverse direction, where maybe I want a priority code or I want to have the highest uh, bit win. But yeah, in this, in this case, we're doing lowest, right? So yeah, we want the... Uh, lowest index to be the one that wins out. Good question. Okay, so if we go ahead and implement this, let's maybe just do the one with gates first. It's gonna look very similar to what we saw a second ago, right? We um, are gonna be concatenating things. We're gonna call it n times. But so what exactly are we doing? Well, we are um, adding together that bit with what was there before, right? So in the case of the gates version, if you remember the structure, what we want to do is whatever this AND gate was here, we're gonna AND it with the bit coming in. So we're gonna leave it to the CAD tools that wants to optimize this, right? So basically you can imagine uh, you could just um, build this out of only two input AND gates, but up here it would be, you know, N deep because, you know, it'd be a, single wire here, this is a two input AND gate. And this next one is this result ANDed with IO.in2, right? So you could do another two input AND gate there. Uh, instead, what we're doing is we're kind of remembering that expression and we are just passing into this recursive function. So every step of this recursion, we aren't just tracking our index, we're passing what we just did uh, and uh, as a result, um, that's going to, uh, or I should say the negation of what we just did, right? And so we kind of build this bigger and bigger AND gate. Uh, and so, yeah, so sometimes the CAD is helpful to kind of, you know, visualize the, the parts, right? So uh, you can see if you even use your, even in Jupyter, you can see with how high is the parenthesis, which we're talking about. Okay, so this paren 
corresponds to the helper function call. Okay. So this whole thing is going to be the first thing that's concatenated. This second thing is going to be the second thing that's concatenated. So these are both one bit results. This is going to be the recursive call. Uh, this one's going to be eventually much more than one bit, right? Because we keep calling deeper and deeper into the recursion. Um, but yeah, so if we were to call this and look at the Verilog, uh, we can kind of see it, right? Where we're going to have, you know, is it, you know, not in zero or, right? And then you can kind of see kind of putting it together, right? So either in zero wins or we're doing T4, which is not in zero. You know, you can substitute these two in there, right? Okay. So that's doing it with gates. Um, I'm going to pause for a second. Um, in addition to looking at the Verilog, we of course could run a little demo. This isn't even a test case really, this is more just a demo. And what are we going to do? Well, we're just going to try all possible values. And I once again, I need to turn on my printf. And you can see, okay, if we pass in a zero, we aren't supposed to do that, but it's going to turn zero. Okay, pass in a one, one Z, uh, lowest priority. Uh, that's the only one, so it's going to be the same one. And now in this case, where both ones are one, that's actually getting interesting now. Uh, you can see they were take, choosing the lowest priority. So it's not one zero, it's zero one, right? Um, cool, okay. So that's a demo of the uh, one hot version with gates. Uh, cool, so uh, let's, what if we did this with the muxes, right? So if the muxes, I'm gonna go ahead and set the code up. Let's go back and look at the diagram for a second. Also going to want to call some recursive n times, but just now we are kind of choosing what we're selecting from. Okay, let's just go ahead and see that. So with muxes, we can see we're recursing, and you know we are uh, either calling our helper function or um, returning that literal. Now remember with muxes, I always forget this. I think you remember remind myself of this. For mux, it's true case then false case. So input one, input zero. I would have always done the reverse, so it's important to remember this. Um, uh, so that's kind of the way I would think of it. Um, and so yeah, if you remember, go back to our diagram for just a second, you can see, you know, for each of these muxes, we want the zero, i.e. this thing is not hot to um, pass through the results of the prior bits. Uh, and if it is one, we want to take the literal, right? So that's why the literal is in the one spot and the zero is the pass through. Um, question from chat is uh, for this understand the behavior of the priority encoder. So wait, so the, um, the bit that's hot should be the one that is the uh, just two to the index, that's the one selected? Yes. However, remember that um, that the number didn't come in as an index, right? The number came in as a number of bits, and so we're, we're picking the lowest one, right? So we kind of have, you know, potentially as you see over here, potentially multiple bits, and we're narrowing that down, right? So we can go ahead and make this maybe a little bit more ambitious. Well, first, let's look at the Verilog for a second, right? And yeah, you can see, okay, the muxes, we have our muxes being generated. Um, just out of curiosity, how does the standard library do it uh, with muxes? Okay, cool. Um, we can leave that intact and then let's go ahead and run the demo again and this time around let's let's let, let it play a little bit let's let it go a little bigger um so we'll have this be three and eight did i forget to assign i out it out yes i did i did not have one of these commented out good job passes um and I forgot the printf again. Okay, almost there. There we go. So you can see now, here's a maybe better example of this one hot encoder running, where you can see that, or prior encoder, where we're just counting through all possible numbers. In the case that only one bit is high, well, you just pass that bit through, right? Uh, that's not too crazy. But now when there's multiple bits that are one, we're gonna pass through the lowest one that's one, right? So in this case, it's one, zero, one. The one is much lower than that one, so that's the one that gets passed through. You know, in this case, these two ones are one. Uh, this one's perhaps a better one to pass through, right? Uh, et cetera. Yeah, so maybe uh, running up to eight is a better example to see more of these cases where 
there's more more bits high. Hope it answers the question. Um, cool. Okay, so um, next is arbitration, but I just want to pause for any questions on the encoding so far. We've just been doing one hot and priority encoders are both useful abstractions and building blocks. They're available in the standard library, but we also did demos of them just to kind of show more examples of recursively building up our generators. Um, and you know, if you're looking at these recursive functions, you're saying, oh my gosh, I'm not sure I could write, you know, this line uh, on the spur of the moment. Uh, no, it's good to take a moment to pause and, you know, think about what you're trying to build. Maybe you can draw a little schematic for yourself to kind of have an idea of it and then kind of build it up. Okay, I'm going to want to concatenate uh, all these bits where I have, you know, and then bit output. I'm starting one bit at a time, so I'm going to concatenation strategy. Uh, maybe instead of one, I was going with muxes kind of passing through. Um, this is, so, yeah, this, this just seems a little fast right away. It's not, not just you. Take some time to kind of think about it. But I guess the important thing is to kind of be aware of, you know, what we're doing here, we're kind of proposing things with recursive functions, um, et cetera. Cool. Well, let's talk about oh, your question. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, thank you for bringing my attention to that. Uh, yes. Uh, so the question is, could you somehow do this instead of a recursion, do this with a for loop? Uh, you probably could. Um, with the for loop, uh, there's some things to keep in mind. Uh, so depending on how you set it up, you might need to use mutation, right? You need like a var to kind of carry over things. Uh, so that's kind of thing where often for ends up with a var while, um, you know, recursion can avoid the need for mutation. The other challenge, and this is one thing that comes up sometimes, especially with these kind of bitwise things, is that in chisel, you can't do what's called a partial assignment. So if I have an n bit signal, you can read into that signal, no problem, by saying, hey, I want that thing at that bit. I can't put this expression on the left side of the connect statement. So I can't have a 32 bit signal and assign only one bit at a time. Uh, this is a common point of contention. A lot of developers would love to do this. Uh, you forgive me for not remembering the developer or the tool developer's motivation for not allowing this capability, but this has been a point of discussion for a good number of years. So there's, as a result, when you have like, you know, an n bit thing, you kind of need to assign it all at once. And so if you want to build up programmatically, sometimes this concatenation is kind of a graceful way to do it. So I would imagine how I would do this with a for loop. Yeah, I'd probably use a var with cat if I was doing the gate version. If I was doing uh, the mux version, yeah, it'd also be a for loop with a var to kind of pass around uh, the trail of the muxes. Now, um, yeah, that's so you definitely do a for loop for sure. Um, cool, great, great question. Thank you for bringing attention to that. Uh, okay. Um, so I think we can still ready to move on to the main event, which is arbitration, right? So um, this is something that comes up all throughout systems, right? Where you have some scarce resource, perhaps, you know, you only have one port to memory and multiple things requesting to go to memory and you got to decide who gets it. Well, if you're the arbiter, the one who chooses who wins, uh, your life is easy if you have uh, no requesters, right? If no one's asking for anything, you don't need to make any choices, right? If one thing is asking for something, your life's also pretty easy. You can just give it to that person, right? You're that, that entity, right? Hey, this component wants this resource. Uh, they're the only one making a request. So guess what? They get it. So really, your challenges don't arise until you have multiple simultaneous requests for the resource. And then it's a question of, okay, well, how do you choose which one wins? Because as I said, it's something where only one person can win or uh, some subset can win. You have to somehow choose that. And you can imagine there's different types of research on this, but the first order, you can choose either a fixed priority, meaning that a certain entity will always win, or you can have a round robin where you make sure that, you know, uh, you kind of change who wins to make sure it's kind of fair, right? So, um, and it depends on the student scenario, right? For example, maybe in a processor design, there's a certain component you don't want to be slowed down and you want to always have access when it needs access, so that one gets a fixed priority. Or maybe you have parallel entities that are equivalent 
in which case you want to have a round robin to make sure there's no biasing, right? So you can kind of see both cases have a need, uh, you know, and it's easy down below. Uh, you know, examples from the set, imagine with a processor, right? Uh, you have the pro to core memory right into a cache line at the same time who wins. A lot of times, believe it or not, it's going to be uh, the memory, right? And the reason why is coming back from memory, you have an entire cache line worth of data. It's a lot of data versus the processor write might be a single word, right? Uh, and so you would rather have the big thing happen uh, rather than a small thing. And so that's why you give perhaps that one the benefit, like a fixed priority in that case. In a network switch, we'll see later on today, you know, these ports are homogeneous or equivalent. It's not fair for one port to always win, right? So in which case we want to rotate. Cool. All right, so how might we do this in Chisel? Well, we'll kind of build our way up to it. So we're gonna have an arbiter. And it's gonna take in, you know, n requests. These are, you know, one bit signals where if you have zero, that person doesn't want it. One, they do want it. And then we're gonna emit uh, the index of which port one, right? So um, potentially, uh, uh, we'll see, right? So we're gonna choose which one one, and depending on the situation, there's different ones, right? So these are actually links to the chisel components, right? So we'll go ahead and go over. You can see this is the arbiter from the standard library. But it's not the only one. Um, there's actually three ones that are commonly used. So the arbiter has a fixed priority by default. You know, so it goes by lowest priority, you know, least significant bit, right? So if port zero makes a request, port zero is going to win every time. Uh, then there's the RR arbiter or round robin arbiter. That's going to, of course, you know, rotate who wins. And then there's actually a more sophisticated version of that called the locking round robin arbiter, where we're not going to show an example of that today, but you can imagine this where it's a situation where let's say someone wants access to a resource and you want them to not just get access to it, but get access to it for multiple cycles, right? Where you don't want to reevaluate every cycle. In that case, you're going to want a locking round robin arbiter to say, you know what? Yes, when someone wins this arbitration battle, they get to keep it for two or four cycles, or you set that parameter to be. Um, that's a more sophisticated case. For today, we'll be happy with just the arbiter and the round robin arbiter. And in terms of the interface, uh, we're actually using decoupled throughout. That's kind of why we lect order lectures in these, this way, right? So we're gonna have these decoupled interfaces. In particular, for each one of these requesters, they're gonna have a decoupled thing coming in, right? So if it's valid, that means they're sending in a request like, hey, I, I want to use this scarce resource. And then um, if they get a ready signal back from the arbiter, you know, that's gonna say that actually they won out, right? So you can imagine the ready signals coming out of here, which are going the opposite direction of these arrows. Uh, at most, one dose can be high at a time. In terms of the valid signals, any number of them can be high, right? Any, any number of requests coming in, but at most one is gonna win, right? It's gonna be granted and get a ready signal coming back. Okay, so then uh, let's go ahead and we're not even gonna try to make our own in this case. We're gonna go ahead and uh, use the built-in ones, right? Alrighty, so um, we have, you know, we're gonna instantiate the arbiter from the library because it's a module, we're gonna use the module to instantiate it. Um, question came in from chat is, are these arbiters, you know, combinational? Do they respond immediately or do they get clock cycle to respond? These are immediate ones. These are combinational ones. So they will respond within the same cycle. Uh, and so, yeah, depending on how big it is and what your critical path is, that could become a critical path. And you might want one that takes an additional cycle. But yeah, these ones today are all combinational. They will make give you a decision uh, right away. Uh, good question. So, yeah. Uh, okay, we're, we're, we're building up uh, our arbiter. And what are we gonna do? Well, this is just a demo. We're just trying to instantiate and kind of connect to some things. So we're gonna connect um, the arbiter's input ports to the input ports to our, our, our demo module. And uh, we're gonna connect the output of the arbiter to the output of this demo module. And really the rest of this is just print statements for us to kind of see what's actually going on inside of it. But really, we're just instantiating an arbiter 
two things, many inputs to the many inputs that came in and this output to the one output, right? And so let's look at the format for just a second, right? Um, what, what are we passing around? Well, the output is a simple decoupled that's n bits wide. And then the inputs are a uh, n bit uint, right? So I want some, you know, eight bits, whatever. And then um, it's decoupled. So we're going to take advantage of the functionalities of the tools to automatically, you know, generate ready and valid for us and that kind of stuff. And then this is a vec. So we're going to have num ports of these decoupled interfaces. And remember that by default, the coupled is in the output direction. And it's actually used for the requests. Those are, if you go back to prior slide, remember those are incoming. Or I should make this io.rec. Um, those are incoming, right? So uh, as a result, uh, they are flipped, right? We'll make these inputs, so to speak. Um, and then, of course, have the output that wins. Cool. Okay. So we can print out the Verilog, but it's going to be more complicated than we want to see for now. <laughs> so let's go ahead and just uh, run the little demo code. Um, so initially, what did I do? Well, this code is going to have all four things requesting, and we're going to keep letting, you know, because of the priority encoding, right, bit zero is going to keep winning. Okay. Well, what if we, you know, instead of having all four, what if we have only two of them? Yeah, we can see that, you know, zero still has a fixed priority. It's going to still keep winning. Okay. All right. Well, what if I, you know, maybe rotate, right? Um, now, the all zero case, like I said, we're not supposed to do that. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because guess what? It's not valid, right? The arbiter is like, you know what? It's not actually a request coming in. So at this point, it's just kind of garbage data because it's not valid. But once we actually have exactly one high, we actually have someone like a request, we see that yes, bit one always wins. Uh, what about if we, for example, maybe change the pattern? We see that, you know, when bit one, um, you know, initially amongst these, well, one's the winner, then two is the lowest one to win, or then three is the lowest one. So you can see how we kind of we can play around with this a little bit and kind of see different cases. Um, but the least significant bit is winning. This is, you know, internally, you can definitely imagine there's a priority encoder here. And, you know, we're just tracking uh, which one is winning the arbitration. So in this case, the arbiter is producing a, you know, index value for what won. It's also in response to the requester on that decoupled port setting that ready bit high, to let it know it won. So it's kind of doing two things at once. Um, cool. Okay. Um, so... We can go ahead and maybe make this all ones again. And we can remind ourselves of why we might get excited about having a round robin, right? You see zero always one. Now we can see it's rotating who wins, right? And so in order to do that under the hood, of course, the round robin arbiter has to have some state, has to have some register to kind of remember who won last and how to deal with that um, versus the original arbiter actually is purely combinational, only logic gates, no state elements. Cool. Okay. Uh, questions on this? So yeah, the question is, what's the difference between this uh, non-round robin arbiter and the priority encoder we just built? Uh, yeah, the original route, the, there's subtle differences, but basically that priority coder is like the majority of the internals of the arbiter for sure. Um, there's, an, there's some additional logic about, you know, the priority encoder, you know, we had, we said the input should never be all zeros. Uh, we also said some other things versus this one, you know, takes in the coupled. There's some extra logic to kind of handle that kind of stuff. But the first order, yes, the, 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 the basic arbiter is essentially a priority encoder internally. You know what? Out of curiosity, if we were to go ahead and see the Verilog, and this might be frightening, I'll be all coming out the printfs, and we'll see uh, what we get. Um, 
yeah, so if you look inside, uh, you can see there's an arbiter just generated and the arbiter is doing some stuff internally. Um, but yeah, it's basically a priority coder internally. Uh, is the way I would answer that. Okay, so yeah, I mean here, we didn't make our own arbiter. We, you know, use the library component, which is normally what we recommend doing. Uh, you know, that's, that's what we wanted. We wanted to use libraries to be productive. Uh, and really all this code here is just us to kind of build a harness around it so we can play around with it and, and see how it kind of behaves under certain circumstances. Um, if you're following along in your own lecture notes, of course, you can play around with different cases and kind of see how those patterns, you know, match up, um, et cetera. Cool. Um, so uh, we're now going to go ahead and reuse that priority encoder to build our own arbiter, right? Um, so this is a good example of us kind of trying to build up one of these structures. So we have all of these a couple of ports coming in. So we really kind of this, our hands full kind of juggling all of these bits. And that's what a lot of this code is going to be for. So as we promised, the internals of this is mostly a one hot encoder. Right, so how do we go about kind of extracting the bits to feed into that one hot encoder? Well, we need to figure out who's making requests. So the requests are coming in on, on all of those valids, right? So let's see what we're doing here. Well, uh, we can do this more gracefully later on in the quarter when we have um, access to uh, functional programming. But for now, what we're gonna do is we are going to uh, declare some vex as wire and as a wire remember we can kind of connect both sides later on or one side at a time later on right and so we're going to take advantage of that to go ahead and use this to you know aggregate all these valid signals coming in so all these valid signals coming in we can go ahead and just grab and so you may be wondering wait a second why is you know this needed to be a vec well you can do you can assign a single element of vec at a time right that's totally fine so Remember a few minutes ago, I was saying how, you know, if you're doing like a uint, you can't assign a single bit of a uint at a time. You cannot, but you totally can assign a single bit of a vec. So if you have a situation where you want to kind of do some build number up, you can definitely um, build a vec of bools. And there's actually a way even to cast it later on to uint if you need that later on. Uh, so that's one thing that's going on here. Okay, then there's also, of course, the bits we're passing through on these decoupled that, you know, end bit u in. So we go ahead and declare a wire for these and we go ahead and grab those. Okay. So then maybe it's better if I move this down. So uh, we let our priority code do heavy lifting, right? We give it all these valid signals and we're getting a response. We're choosing to use the one hot variant. So we have that one hot coming out. And um, what are we gonna do with that? Well. If, um, so we have to do a couple things, right? So we, we want to um, have the right output, right? So uh, we're gonna go ahead and do a couple things here. We're going to select the output based on which one was chosen. So we have all these bits we connected. These are all the, you know, the data paths coming through and in this case, we had one hot values already. We can keep it one hot, and that's where this mux one hot here. Um, to not bother encoding and re-encoding and binary and back and forth is actually substantially more efficient. We already have things in one hot. It's good to kind of keep rolling with that. And then um, to actually get that, the conversion I described a second ago, where we had a one hot signal returning into a uint, we can use that to go ahead and let them know they won. So how do we let them know we won? Well, by default, we're saying they're all gonna be false, meaning they didn't get the grant. And then um, in the case that one of them does get the grant, we're gonna go ahead and set that one to true. So remember it's that last connect semantics for, uh, for, for when, right? Where um, this line is later in these lines. So in the case that this one is triggered, uh, this is gonna take precedence, right? And so uh, what would cause the output to fire? Remember the, Output's gonna fire when someone's listening to it. So there's a, there's a array signal coming in and that we're valid. And we're valid uh, 
if at least one of our inputs is valid, right? So um, here we are taking in um, this vec, we're turning it into a uint directly, and then we are doing what's called an or reduction. Really, you can just think of it as taking all the bits in there and combining them together, which for an or reduction, if you think about it, uh, you know, so you have, you know, an n-bit number coming in and the result's a single bit, you know, really you're kind of asking, is this equal to zero or not, right? Because anything that's one, once you have a one in there, is you keep oring through and keep being one, right? So the only way that whole thing becomes zero is if the entire thing is zero. Um, but an or reduction is a way to kind of capture that. Uh, cool. So we're going to optimize some of the stuff on the next slides. It might be more clear, but I'll pause for now. Any questions on this, right? We're kind of demonstrating some uses of VEX, some uses of these encoders and the one hot. And somebody's kind of a good example of things put together. Um, cool. So, uh, one thing you might be wondering is what we, so we said it was nice to kind of keep things one hot when we can. And we, we, we kind of broke that, right? We went through the effort to, uh, you know, convert this one hot back to a uint, right? So this was, you know, an, a two to the n bit thing back to an n bit thing, so to speak. Uh, and then we use that to index into uh, this vec, right? Um, and so if you have a vec in your chisel design, and you never index into it dynamically, it doesn't generate any muxes. It's actually just going to be handled pretty efficiently, right? So, you know, this is now going to have that dynamic addressing and all stuff. So, wait, we already had a, a one hot thing. So, can we just kind of regurgitate that one hot thing for the chosen back out on the readies? And the answer is yes. So, that's this next slide. Um, so, this one might be more clear, it might be simpler. It's definitely be better hardware. Uh, the reason why I didn't lead off with this one is it not only used fewer components, but it also um, does things out of order, right? We take advantage of the fact that you can declare wires and you can connect them later on. So we still have this notion of all the invalids, all the valid signals coming in, right? All the bits coming in, right? And so we can go ahead and uh, grab those, right? So that's just like the prior thing. Um, however, going through each one of these ports, we can now also send backwards a ready signal, right? And a ready signal is gonna be uh, that chosen one hot, so, we're extracting that single bit. And it's not just enough to do that. We also need to let it know if we're firing, right? Because if we're not firing, uh, i.e. we're not actually doing a transaction that just chosen one hop might be garbage. And so we don't want to kind of be tricked by it. So we're only going to fire, uh, we're only going to let this be one if it's firing. And so you can see that, yeah, we actually, in this case, we are, you know, um, creating things even before we fully attach them all, right? Where, for example, uh, we're going to sign the ready. Uh, and it's going to be based on some of these other things, you know, well, how is IO.fire set up? Well, IO.fire is, of course, when uh, we're valid and ready, right? And so here's the valid being set. Um, and then the bits, of course, are also using that box and hot again. So this is a, perhaps a simpler one. Maybe this one makes people a lot happier. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll pause for questions for now. Um, Yeah, so the question is, uh, what's the difference between like, you know, this one hot or wired to call this encoding function? Isn't it already a number? It's definitely a number, but it's a matter of how you interpret it, right? So a one hot number, if you look at it numerically, would appear to always be a power of two, right? It'll be, you know, uh, one, two, four, eight, et cetera. Um, but we know indices aren't always powers of two, right? It can be any arbitrary number, right? You know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so, um, this is it's the, it's the question of how we interpret those wires, right? And so this helper function I've highlighted is saying, you know what? Uh, I want to take a two to the n bit set of one hot wires and re encode that as a you know, dense binary number that's only n bits and you know, interpret it that way, right? So, for example, if I, um, in, so you see, so you imagine, right? So I have a two to the n bit set of wires coming in that chosen one hot. You know, if only bit zero is hot, then the output of the whole thing is going to be and then bit zero. But let's say, you know, on the chosen one hot, 
uh, you know, bit two, hypothetically, uh, is um, hot. Uh, numerically, that'll be four, but index-wise, we want it to be two. And so that kind of thing would handle this. So technically, even though it's called by, you know, the Chisel library, you know, one hot to uint, you can think of this as like a binary encoder, right? It's taking a one hot as input and encoding as a binary uh, number is what this kind of operation is doing. And so, yeah, in, in these cases, right, we're always dealing with numbers. It's just a question of are there certain rules or semantics or details on them, right? So one hot's a, uh, yeah, so yeah, the question is, noise stateness is a one hot index? Yes, it's exactly one hot index, the way to think of that thing, right? And so uh, this one, is just blindly casting the types. It's not actually changing the the actual wires. It's just, you know, I had, you know, n one bit wires as a VEC. Now I have an n bit uint. That's what it as uint is doing on a VEC. This one's actually encoding, right? I had a two to the n bit one hot encoding and now it's turning into an index. And so yeah, an index is a denser encoding. Okay, sounds like we're good. Um, yeah, so like I said, sometimes one hot encodings are nice. Um, it makes some things very efficient where you kind of have this natural parallelism hardware. And even though it seems like you have like a lot of wires kind of fanning out, because the wires are one hot, you can often simplify the endpoints since it's kind of very easy to kind of have it. So there's very wide buses of wires going around, but if it's not going far in the actual generated hardware, it can be quite efficient. Um, and so, yeah, so today we kind of seen uh, how this all play together. And, yeah, you can see how within uh, an arbiter, we kind of built our way up here, right? We talked about one hot encodings. <laughs> we talked about priority encoders. And for our non round Raman arbiter, it's basically a priority encoder, right? Most of that's the real interesting part of what's going on here, right? Everything else here is kind of the bookkeeping and the counting, right? You know, how to kind of line up our inputs such that it's appropriate to be passed into this thing. And to notice how here we're passing in this VEC and this VEC hasn't even been connected yet. We connected it actually later on. That's okay, right? It's like a forward, you know, declaration in a way. Um, and so this is kind of interesting about hardware, right? Is if we're doing this as a hardware, as a program, this wouldn't make sense. But as hardware, right, what we're just doing is we're describing connections, right? And so we're saying, hey, you know what? Build a, you know, declare a VEC, build a priority encoder if that VEC is input. And then later on, you say, let's go ahead and attach this input of that VEC, right? Um, and this was, of course, reading the output of that VEC. And so, even though as a program order may not make sense, if you think about this in terms of, you know, I have these things and kind of connecting them in a certain order, building up this graph as a hardware design, it does kind of make more sense. So, one of the things kind of common in hardware design languages is you actually often can reorder some statements and it doesn't change the semantics of the program because, or the hardware design, because what you're doing is you're just describing connections and it's the same connections even if you reorder them. And that's what's happening here. Cool. Okay. So we've built our own arbiter. Uh, that was an exercise, right? I mean, as we said, uh, chisel some wonderful ones just waiting for you. Um, and yeah, uh, if we go ahead and test out our own arbiter, uh, you know, we're gonna run the same kind of demos like before. Uh, we can see, for example, you know, uh, the lowest one's always gonna win, or if we wanna maybe make it, uh, give a chance for the higher ones, we can do that too. Um, Cool. Let's talk about a crossbar. So uh, we've been kind of building our way up today. We've been kind of building a component and then building a component that's a little bit more sophisticated that uses that other component internally, right? So we used a priority encoder to build an arbiter. Now we're gonna use arbiters to build something called a crossbar. So a crossbar is a, a networking thing. It doesn't necessarily need to be like an IP network. It could just be like a network between hardware components on chip or something. but what it does is it has some more of input ports, some more of output ports, and you know it connects them, right? So, you know maybe a lot of times the network you have multiple hops, you got to kind of be routed and stuff. No, crossbar is trying to be a direct, you know, one hop thing, right? And so, as a result, crossbars typically have scalability limits. You only can build a crossbar with so many ports. Uh, but for a handful of ports, yeah, you can definitely build it, and sometimes it's very much worth it. Uh, and so, how do we build it? Well, we're gonna have input ports and output ports uh, because, you know, it could be the case that there could be contention in this crossbar design. Uh, there's no guarantee when you make a request, it's going to be sent, right? So these are all decoupled, right? That you need to indicate you're making a request. That is, you know, you're sending, you're marking this as valid. I'm making a, a message I want to send. Likewise, the crossbar needs to tell you 
it's being delivered, right? Maybe it says, you know what, not right now. It's not going to be ready. Um, why might it say no? Even though we're building all this dedicated hardware, if multiple senders try to message the same output port, what happens? Well, in this design, we're choosing to put an arbiter there, right? So we're saying, you know what, these ports can only hold one message at a time. And so if we have multiple people trying to send a message to the same port, we're going to use an arbiter to choose who wins. Cool. Okay. So yeah, really what we're going to be doing in this design in a second is we're going to be, you know, instantiating an arbiter for every output port and then connecting every input port to every arbiter. As you can see, it's, there's a lot of connections here, right? This is, you know, if I have, you know, n inputs, m outputs, there's n times m connections being made here, right? Oof. Okay, let's see if we can put this together. Um, so first, let's go ahead and define some bundles, right? So how are we going to kind of extract things on this network? Let's call something uh, we call a message. It's going to have an address, which is, you know, some destination port is trying to get to as well as some sort of payload, the data, right? And, you know, because we can, we can make these parameterized. Uh, we can have, of course, a variable size. We can set the payload size at generation time. We also can need to, and not just can, we also need to include the number of outputs when we make this bundle, right? Because we need to know how big to make this address field, right? Um, we want to uh, include that, right? Okay, and then uh, if we look at, uh, so that's a single message, right? And at this point, this is really just kind of a, a pair of, of uints, right? So uints for the address, uint for the data. If look at the actual IO we're gonna build for an entire crossbar. We're gonna have some number of inputs, some number of outputs, and some payload size. And well, we need to use vex to declare those ports, right? So we have, you know, a vec of a number of inputs, a vec of a number of outputs, uh, remember, you know, these decoupled things by default are kind of in the output direction. So for each output port, you have to get a decoupled message. And for each input port, it's also a decoupled message, but it's flipped because it's in the input direction. Okay, so then that's our I.O. We should go ahead and uh, generate this. And this is nice. Here we're kind of using some chisel to, you know, build some abstractions. The reason where you generate this message bundle, we can kind of keep using this abstraction throughout. Um, so now let's actually build a crossbar. And so what are we gonna do? Well, we declare IO from that crossbar we just talked about, we're passing through those parameters, okay. Um, and then we're gonna need our arbiters, one per output port. So, you know, we want these num outs, number of output ports. We're actually gonna use the sequence of all these because we're actually not gonna be addressing these in hardware, we're addressing these only in generators. So a Scala sequence is perfect here. Uh, so we're going to fill, you know, what are we filling it with? We're filling it with uh, instances of these arbiter. So when you make an arbiter, uh, if you remember what the um, requirements were, we had to give it the thing that you're arbiting, in which case it's a message, and number of ports. Uh, in this case, number of input ports. And we actually made a choice already to go for a round robin arbiter, right? It's so the network we want to be fair, so we're going to go round robin. Okay, so then... For um, all these, we can go ahead and kind of connect things up. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to need to connect up all the ready signals uh, for these various things, right? So remember, if you go back to our diagram, these arbiters, um, even though it draws a single direction arrow, remember this is decoupled, so there's actually a, a ready signal going in the reverse direction back, right? And yeah, each of these arbiters is going to produce, you know, num inputs, readies, and needs to wire all these back to those inputs, right? So that's what we're going to do in that first set of loops here. So we're using a doubly nested for loop here because we're doing it once for um, each input and then for each output, right? So for each input, we want to gather together all the readies. So how are we doing this? Well, we're going to build, declare uh, a vec as a wire, right? So we can go ahead and say, hey, I want to connect these. I'm going to go through and for each possible output, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, grab these, right? So um, this is maybe perhaps the opposite direction of what you might be thinking about. So this 
take a second to kind of talk our way through this, right? So we're going in the outer loop in terms of input ports, right? So if we go back a slide, we're saying, hey, I'm here. So I'm gonna need to have a array signal from each one of these output ports. So each output port is gonna be associated with, you know, it's an arbiter. So I'm gonna need to have those kind of come in. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, uh, pull those back like that. Okay, so I'm gonna declare this thing and basically just kind of iterate through. And for every one of those arbiters, now I'm kind of going inside the arbiter. The arbiter has IO, its input, for the port corresponding to me, right? So right now I'm doing IP, you know, input port, you know, whatever the number is. I'm grabbing that ready and I'm putting it into this um, this vec, right? And um, now that I've collected all of these ray signals across all of the arbiters uh, in this vec, I'm gonna go ahead and take them and reduce it like we saw a second ago, right? So in other words, uh, if you go back to this interface, right? Uh, you know, even though each of these wires internally is going to be, you know, uh, decoupled, there's only one ray signal here. And so I need to take the OR of all the ray signals from all of the arbiters intended for my input port and merge those together. So that's what that thing we we're looking at was. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so that's kind of being all brought together. Uh, and then for the, uh, now we're going in terms of the output ports. So for each output port, OP, we're gonna go through each of the input ports. So it's doubly nested again. We're gonna go ahead and connect up the inputs to our module, you know, from this original inputs to our crossbar to the arbiter. Okay. And then um, we also want to uh, do the requesting. So the requesting is not only is the input port valid, but is it coming to me in particular, right? So you can see how uh, when a message uh, comes in on one of these ports, it's broadcast to you know all the arbiters, right? And it's actually only intended to go to one of them, right? So which one is intended to go to is that address inside the message field, and that's making sure it's intended for you. Cool. And then we, uh, of course, after connecting these all together, we're connecting the uh, output port to the output of the uh, arbiter associated with that port. Whew. Okay. Now I saw a question come in from chat is what happens, you know, if there is a message that, you know, reaches a contested port and it can't be sent? Uh, is there any kind of buffering or something? So the buffering is actually needs to be at the sender, right? So the sender is trying to send a message. It's using the couple thing to indicate this. So, you know, it's using the couple and then marks that as valid, meaning I'm trying to send this. Um, if it doesn't receive ready in response, that means that message was not sent. And so if that's the case, it's gonna hang on to the message and do it. So the answer is the buffering is at the senders. It's not shown, that's on the senders to handle it. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's not inferred, it's up to senders to implement that. Okay. Um, and so yeah, we can go ahead and, you know, synthesize this, um, but really what we've done is basically made a arbiter per port, right? And um, cut to together all the appropriate readies and valids to kind of do all this extra work here. So here we're kind of doing a lot of for loops, except in a few weeks we'll cover this with functional programming. It's gonna be a lot more uh, graceful about this, um, et cetera. Okay, I see another question coming from chat. If every input goes to every arbiter, why don't all arbiters choose the same value? Uh, they don't get quite the same inputs because the arbiters are selecting based on is it intended for them, right? So they, they get the, the the valid signals, but then we're going to end that with is this message actually intended for that port? If it's not intended for that port, this comparison is going to fail and it's going to seem like it's not requesting it. It's not going to have a valid signal. Good question. Um, Cool, okay, so let's go ahead and demo it. So yeah, we say, let's just call this a demo to be honest, right, this is not a test. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and run it. And so what happens? Well, uh, things are moving, right? So <laughs> what are we even trying to send this test case? Well, we are sending data, each line is a cycle, and we're indicating successful transfers, right? So port two sends something to port zero, 
port one since we're into port one, right? Um, and we can kind of play around with uh, our patterns, what we're trying to send to each other. You know, so me just kind of generating synthetic examples. Uh, you know, we can see in this case, it's gonna wrap around. So we're gonna have three saying to zero and zero saying to one. Um, and I may be wondering, wait a second, uh, going through this by cycles, it doesn't appear that um, I'm changing the uh, input pattern, right? You can see that uh, I set inputs once and then I call step four times, and yet the messages being sent are changing. Yes, that's because we're using a round robin arbiter, right? So if I was to go back to a fixed priority, we would see the output from this simple example not changing because the lowest precedence keeps winning. Zeros I keep sending to itself and ones send to one and and that's all folks. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and have our rotating, or round robin, I should say. But if you don't think it was rotating, it's perhaps not a bad mental model. And there we have it. So yeah, this is a, a dense lecture, but it's a lot here. Uh, hopefully you can kind of see some of the the gracefulness and niceness of Chisel when it's, when it's doing its things, right? We're able to kind of make these nice abstractions and kind of keep building things up. So at the end of the day, we actually aren't asking the tools to do crazy uh, inference, right? We are describing what we're doing every step of the way. We're just building abstractions and then building an abstraction on top of that. We're kind of making things and building bigger things with those things. So every step of the way, we are very definitively saying what hardware we want. I want this to be connected to this. I want to instantiate this thing. And we see what the crossbar is doing. Most, most of what we're doing here is connecting stuff, right? We're constantly connecting. Like that's very common in these hardware designs is you're basically instantiating things and connecting things. And in this case, there was a lot of ports, a lot of things flowing around. Um, we're using for loops today. In the future, we use functional programming. Uh, question from chat was, is there a good reference on crossbars in general? Um, hopefully, I'd be happy to take additional questions now about that, uh, or maybe we can find a source on the web together. Um, the internals, yeah, it's worth maybe taking a look at the figure and the code and going back and forth a few times to kind of see how it kind of fits together. But for the high-level point of view, the idea is we have, you know, some number of inputs, some number of outputs. So these are kind of a one-way thing, right? So, you know, usually networks are bi-directional. For now, this is one way, right? And so uh, we're just trying to say, hey, I have these things trying to send it to other ways. And so each of these ports is going to have a message with data and an address, right? An address is addressing which of these output ports it wants to go to. And because we're not sending a message every cycle, this is decoupled, and both we want to use valid to indicate I'm trying to send a message, and we're getting a ready back from the crossbar indicating if it's accepted or not. But yeah, that's kind of what we're getting at. Um, yeah, so I'll stay on after a turn of recording to answer additional questions on that. Um, yeah, maybe we'll go ahead and wish everyone a good day and stop the recording.